Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11. So we're coming to the end of our study, and uh, we've got one more lesson after this. So our text is chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, but I'm first going to read a verse out of Romans, which parallels the concern that Paul has in this passage. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. You don't need to turn to it. Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. Now, as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. Labor pains, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. The Greeks had a story to explain things the way the world is. It's a story about Pandora, who was given a box with a warning label, do not open. So she did. Curiosity got the best of her. She opened the box, and out came all of the evils in the world. Christians have had the same problem with the question of when Christ will return. They can't help but look into it to find a date. And the results have always been bad. The 12 disciples did this. One day Jesus sat down on the Mount of Olives across from the temple and they asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? He gave them the signs, but he added, of that day or hour, no one knows. About 50 day, days later, they were back on the Mount of Olives before the Lord ascended into heaven and they asked again. And Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed. That's pretty clear. But it hasn't stopped Christians from trying to figure out the date. The history of the church is sprinkled with embarrassing events that are warning signs not to do that. One of the most famous happened when the Baptist preacher, William Miller, calculated from his study of the Bible that Jesus would return on October 22, 1844. He gained a large following of people that became known as Millerites. And one version of the story is that some of them put on white robes and they went on top of a hill and they waited. And they were disappointed. And many even lost their faith. A group in Korea looked for Jesus to come in October 1992 with um, very unhappy results. Christian radio broadcaster predicted Christ would return on May 21, 2011. He had a following. 
They put up billboards in cities across America announcing Judgment Day. They put them up here in Dallas. I remember seeing that. The next day, he said he was flabbergasted. That was his word. He repented, called his attempt to predict sinful, and he quoted Matthew 24, verse 36, of that day or hour, no one knows. But curiosity is hard to resist. So if history is any guide, we can be sure that there will be others who open the box and again, evils will fly out. The desire for a date is strong. And it may have been strong among the Thessalonians. At least early on, they, they may have been confident in the Lord's coming that it was near at hand. But times had changed when this letter was written. Members had died, persecution continued, and the Lord had not come. So they'd become confused and may have begun to lose confidence in the Lord's return, at least in His coming for them in their lifetime. The danger was that they would lose hope altogether. They would lose interest altogether. Both are problems in the church, being too precise about the time of the Lord's coming on the one hand and becoming indifferent to it on the other. Paul warns against both in these verses. He told the Thessalonians in chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that the Lord is coming. The saints who died wouldn't miss that coming. They'd be very much a part of it. They would experience the resurrection. They would be with Him. And the saints who were alive here on earth when He came would be caught up together with them. They'd be transformed in the air and they would join them and the Lord forever. Well, now in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, He makes three points about Christ's coming. First of all, it's unexpected. It's like a thief in the night, and the world will not be prepared for it. But secondly, the church is prepared. We are sons of day, not sons of night, and so we are to be alert. And then thirdly, we're to encourage one another with this hope. And he says, that's what you are doing. He reminds him of that at the end. Well, Paul begins the chapter by reminding the Thessalonians that they didn't need an explanation of the times and epochs. That's the same expression that Jesus used in Acts chapter 1, verse 7. They already had been taught on this subject. The times and epochs or seasons is the future. It's the end times. That's what it refers to, though there may not be any significant difference between the two words, signs and epochs. But if there is if we can make a distinction, then it's probably something like the time, the times is chronology. It's the sequence of time. It's the unfolding of the ages, while epics may refer to special moments in history. In fact, A.T. Robertson translated this, periods and points, periods of time, and then particular points of, of uh, events in history. Well, either way, Paul meant that they understood how the future would unfold. They'd been taught. They were well grounded in eschatology, which is an interesting fact, and I've pointed this out before, but they had this instruction in just a brief time, two weeks, three weeks, and he evidently spent a great deal of time on the subject of eschatology, of the future. And so, so much time that he could say they knew these events, they knew things, they didn't need all of this explained to them. They knew there was no way, in other words, to predict when the end would come. They knew, as he said in verse 2, that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And how does a thief come? Well, unexpectedly. So what Paul is saying is, you know that you can't know. We know the day is coming, but we can't know precisely when, which is what the Lord told His disciples twice. In fact, in Matthew 24, verse 43, He used the analogy of the thief breaking into a house to illustrate the unexpectedness of the day, of the moment, of the end and His coming. The day of the Lord 
is an expression we find throughout the Bible. It's taken from Amos chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 18 through 20. The prophet tells unbelieving Israelites, he's speaking to apostate Israel, who expected the day to be a day of deliverance from their enemies, he's telling them, no, no. It won't be a day of deliverance. It'll be a day of judgment, of darkness, not light. You're expecting peace, and you are not going to receive peace. But Paul says something very similar in verse 3. It will be a time of judgment on the unbelieving. While they are saying peace and safety then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. Labor pains come on a woman unexpectedly, not, not completely, of course. A pregnant woman knows that they're inevitable. Uh, she's pregnant, but she can't know the day or the hour, even though uh, they predict the doctors can use a, make an educated guess about a day. It doesn't necessarily happen that way. And that's the point he's making. You can't know when that's going to happen. The day of the Lord is like that. We, we know it's coming. The Lord and the prophets have revealed it. They've prophesied it. That, that's what we can expect. Jesus spoke of events like wars and rumors of wars in Matthew 24, verse 8. And, and, and he speaks of them as the beginnings of the birth pangs. He was prophesying what really has been occurring for the past 2,000 years, the times. There are times of wars and rumors of wars and all of the things that he describes that have been happening throughout history. But the labor that Paul speaks of hasn't yet begun. It will come suddenly. And when it does, it will be like... Uh, the, the labor pains of, of birth coming and when a husband has to rush his wife to the hospital or call the midwife. It's something Isaiah prophesied. Find it in the Old Testament. He prophesied this day of the Lord in chapter 13 and verses 16 through 13. I mean, rather, verse 6 through 13. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp, and every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will look at one another in astonishment. Their face is aflame. He goes on to say that the sun and the moon will be dark, and the Lord will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. In other words, judgment is coming on the earth, on this world in unbelief. And then earlier than that, in chapter 2, Isaiah spoke of the day of the Lord. In verse 12, he called it a day of reckoning. And in verse 17, he wrote, The pride of man will be humbled, and the loftiness of men will be abased. And the Lord will be exalted in that day, but the idols will completely vanish. Men will go into caves of the rocks and into holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty when He arises to make the earth tremble. Well, this is judgment that is predicted. It's judgment for the unbelieving world. The church is promised release from that. Deliverance from that. That's the hope that Paul has given in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, what we looked at last week, and, and the promise of the rapture. But it's also the promise here in chapter 5, verse 9, where Paul says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've discussed this word wrath more than once. Uh, and how it's used, for example, in chapter 1, verse 10, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. And that is not, in this context, a reference to hell, but to the judgment on the earth, the judgment of the day of the Lord. The same word for wrath is used in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17, to describe the great tribulation. I think we may have looked at that last week. 
It's the fulfillment of what Isaiah described and we just read from Isaiah chapter 2. The Lord broke the sixth seal in Revelation 6. And there was an earthquake. The sun was darkened. The sky split apart. The men of the earth, great and small, kings and slaves are terrified. That's how they're described. They hide in caves among the rocks and they pray to the mountains and they pray to the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of the Lamb and the great day of their wrath. Uh, that's the word orge, this word wrath. And it's not, again, hell, but the day, the great day. And that fits the context of 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2, the day of the Lord. We're not destined for it. So it comes after the rapture of the church. And because the day will come like a thief... And the rapture is connected with that. The events of the rapture are connected with that. Believers need to be ready for it. Not like the world, which will be caught unprepared, living in false security, saying peace and safety. And so in the next part of the passage, in verses 4 through 8, Paul tells the Thessalonians to be alert and sober. The day of the Lord is coming. Similar to what Paul said in Romans 13, he, in verse 11. He, he does this, he gives this warning by contrasting them, believers, with unbelievers. He speaks of they and you. They, meaning the unbelievers, will be overtaken by the day because of their moral character. They are darkness and night, he says. They are in unbelief, and they're in unbelief either because of ignorance of the day or in disbelief of the day. I suspect if you were to tell, uh, talk to a typical unbeliever about this, he'd scoff at the idea. He'd mock it. So they will not escape the judgment. The world is always surprised by judgment, caught by surprise. It doesn't listen to the Word of God, and so it's caught by surprise. God gave the ancient world Enoch and Noah, both preachers of righteousness who told of judgment to come. No one listened. No one other than Noah and his family. The flood came, swept the world away. Judgment fell on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot warned his family, but they wouldn't listen. In fact, you read the text, his sons-in-law thought he was joking. That tells us everything about Lot and nothing about the message. He gave a true message, but they couldn't believe him. And why is that? Because from an early date, you remember, Lot separates from Abraham. He pitched his, he took the beautiful part of the area, the green valley. It was luxuriant. And he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He didn't enter Sodom, but he longed to go to Sodom. And then the next time we see him in chapter 19, he's in Sodom. In fact, he's sitting in the gate. He's a prominent citizen. He'd conform to Sodom. So much so that when he speaks the truth, his sons-in-law think he's joking with them. He can't take him seriously about spiritual things. Well, his message was true. Nevertheless, and judgment came. In both cases, the unbelieving world was thinking peace and safety. Message of judgment's foolish. It was unprepared and overtaken in judgment. In fact, Jesus used these same examples in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. But in both cases, believers escaped. Noah from the flood and Lot from the fire, they were prepared. That is a pattern of God's people being delivered before judgment. So Paul says, you are different, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. They had new natures. They were new creatures in Christ. And as a result of that, they had new capacities, different capacities from the world. They have understanding. They possess the revelation of God's Word. And so they can understand the revelation of God's Word. They have the Spirit of God. They have all of this. And so they 
should not be surprised by the coming day. They should be alert. They should be ready for it. So based on their spiritual condition and their position as believers, Paul exhorts them in verses 6 through 8 to be alert and vigilant. Don't be like the world. Verse 6, So then let us not sleep as do others, but let us be alert and sober. There is a problem of having a fascination with things we can't know. So that people want to look into the times and seasons and find a a specific date. But there's equally a problem of having too little interest. Of being so caught up in the present age that we neglect the Lord's return and preparing for it. Instead of watching, believers, genuine believers, sleep. Peter, James, and John did that when the Lord was about to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember. He goes in and he asked them to keep watch while he prayed. It's a simple task. Just keep watch for me. They didn't. Their eyes became heavy. They became overcome with sleep. In fact, they did that twice in that evening. So the Lord told them, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yes, it is. And Paul here exhorts us to be watching and praying. He's exhorting them to do that because he knows the flesh is weak. He knows they were discouraged and he knows how seductive the world is and how easy it is to begin to drift. Don't sleep. Be sober. Sons of light and sons of day know that each day is moving us closer to the day of the Lord and that we should be watching. That Again, that's Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Paul explains in verse 7, certain kinds of conduct are typical for sons of night and not appropriate for sons of day. The unbeliever, the unbelievers are either dull with sleep, uh, spiritual sleep, or they are um, reckless. Verse 7, for those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. Believers, believers of course, uh, sleep physically at night, but we can never sleep spiritually. We can never drift spiritually. We must always be alert. And in verse 8, Paul sets believers in contrast to unbelievers and the unprepared with an emphatic, but we, to show that we Christians are different. It's a reminder to the Thessalonians A reminder to all Christians, a reminder to us that we are not like the world. We are new creatures, a new creation, and so we are to behave differently from the world. And here, in specific, specifically, we're to be behave by being watchful, not unwatchful, by being prepared, not unprepared. Verse 8, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Christians are like sentries keeping watch in the night. Um, There's no time for sleeping for one who is keeping watch, guarding the city. We're like that. And Warren Wearsby has a a clever summary of this verse. Uh, He wrote, it's time to wake up, clean up, and dress up. Well, that's true, but that doesn't quite fit the the grammar of this verse. Uh, Put on the breastplate is an aorist participle. Excuse me for the grammar, but uh, I need to make the point. And it's a past participle that refers to the action uh, of the main verb uh, as preceding that. So uh, the main verb is let us be sober. And the idea is having already done that, having put on the armor, now be sober. That's how the New American Standard Bible expresses that. Believers have the armor. 
We already have that. We are fully clothed and protected at the new birth. So we're to act on that. We're, we're, we're to be, we're to act as we are. We are to be alert. We're to be sober. We're to be watchful. We have this armor. We have the hope of salvation. And certainly we should act upon that hope. And certainly salvation from eternal wrath, we have that. But here the subject of the passage is rescue from the day of the Lord and, and judgments that will come upon the world. Now that's a great encouragement to know that we, we will be delivered from that. And it gives us incentive, at least it should give us incentive, to vigilance in the Christian life and sobriety in the Christian life. John gives that exhortation negatively in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, where he writes, Now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame at, at his coming. Now, what he's saying is, we're to be watchful. We're to be ready. The way that we ready ourselves is by abiding in Him, being in fellowship with Him, thinking about Him, walking with Him. When one is doing that, one is prepared. But the point he's making is we are to be watchful and we are to be ready. In verses 9 and 10, Paul reinforces that idea by reassuring the Thessalonians that his promise in chapter 1, verse 10, uh, of rescue from the wrath to come when Christ comes from heaven is certain for us. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Our deliverance from the wrath of the day of the Lord is due solely to Christ's saving work, just as our deliverance from eternal damnation is. Now that indicates something about the design and the extent of Christ's sacrifice and the atonement that He made. He will rescue those for whom He died, which is the church, not the unregenerate world. And that shows both the, the power of the cross to save and the greatness of the grace of God to save, because the promise to rescue God's people is certain for all alive at that time, whether we are awake or asleep. Well, that raises a question of interpretation, and that is, who are these two groups, the awake and the asleep? And we might think, from our studies in this book, that the dead and the living saints... Uh, is what this is referring to, those who are, uh, who are dead and those who are alive when he comes. That's, after all, the concern that the Thessalonians had. They want, wanted to know about the dead. Will they miss the day of the Lord or miss his coming and, and the, ra the, the rapture and, and all of the great events? And in chapter 4 and verse thir 13, Paul refers to the deceased loved ones as asleep. It's the same word that he used in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, of saints who have died. Believers who die sleep. That's his word for a Christian's death because it expresses rest, and they've entered into their rest, in their heavenly rest. Paul said that they will rise first in the rapture and that those who remain, those who are alive when the Lord returns, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So we might think that he's speaking of those because of the previous statements. But the word asleep here in verse 10 is not the same word that he used in chapter 4, verse 13, and, chapter, and verse 15, and in 1 Corinthians 15. Here, Paul used a different word to refer to a different class of people. Not the physically dead saints, but living saints who were spiritually asleep, 
who are unwakeful, who are inattentive, who are unwatchful. The Thessalonians were concerned about those who had died. Would they miss the Lord's coming? Paul was concerned about the Thessalonians who were alive. Were they awake? Were they alert? Were they spiritually attentive? This, the issue of this book was, first of all, to reassure the Thessalonians of, of their uh, great hope in the, uh, of the Lord's return and, and that their friends, their loved ones who had, who had died would not be left out of that. They'd be very much a part of it. They will come with the Lord and rise first, and there will be a great reunion in the sky, and together we will be with the Lord always, forever. But secondly, his purpose in this book and his purpose here was to encourage the Thessalonians to remain alert and continue doing what they had been doing from the beginning, waiting for the Lord's return. Be diligent in that. But the hope that they had of the rapture, of being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, was for both groups, for the awake as well as for those who are asleep. Now that's the greatness of grace. The the promise doesn't depend upon us and our alertness. It depends wholly and completely on the Lord. That's the nature of grace. When it happens, when the Lord comes, when the rapture occurs, those who are asleep, those who are maybe a bit worldly, who are lethargic, who are not paying attention, who are not diligent, as as Paul is exhorting them to be, will be awakened then, and they will be awakened suddenly. It will be in a moment of, uh, uh, of, of instant sobriety. A clear-headedness will, will be uh, th- their experience at that moment, but also shame. And that's what John warned against in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, shrinking away in shame at His coming. But that is the sanctifying influence that this hope of the Lord's any moment return has on His people. It's the sanctifying influence that it should have upon us. It keeps us aware of of our our need to be alert and to be living earnestly for the Lord. It keeps us sober-minded and watching. But still, Paul was saying that regardless of our success or failure as Christians, the Lord's promise won't fail for any one of His people. He comes for all, the alert and the dull. It's not an encouragement to be dull or to be indifferent in any way. It's just the opposite. But the fact of the matter is, He will come for all His people. Well, you ask perhaps, what about that parable of the ten virgins? You know, the five who slept and and didn't have their lamps trimmed when the bridegroom came. They weren't allowed into the wedding feast. That is a parable about professors, that is, people who profess faith. Not all who profess have what they profess, have oil in the lamp, have faith and new life, have the Holy Spirit. Not all are born again. So as Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you. But the fact is, Those who have been chosen and called by the Lord, who are born again, do slip, do drift, become spiritually inattentive, become worldly. We all struggle with that. We all fall into that at times. They they are like the three disciples mentioned earlier, Peter, James, and John, who were to keep watch while Jesus went into the garden to pray. They didn't. They slept. They were unprepared when the hour came and they were ashamed. But still disciples, nonetheless. Lot was worldly when the angels warned him. But he was still righteous Lot, Peter said, and he was rescued. We we want to be better than that. 
We want to be unashamed. We, we want to be unworldly. We want to be found faithful, hard at work in the Lord's service, don't we? This, this promise of Christ, of Christ coming and coming at any moment should stimulate alertness within us. And it will if we are earnest and paying attention to Paul and the apostles and the instruction they give. But we might ask, what does this alertness look like? I began the study with a, a warning about setting dates. Uh, that's a, a hazard that sometimes comes from looking for the Lord's any moment return, setting a date. Well, people look for signs of the times and in current events. We do that. We look for things like uh, political conditions and technological changes. And we find in all of these, these events that are occurring in this, uh, this, the world in which we're living, um, uh, evidence that, well, the, the, there's a, a the place for the seals to be broken and the apocalypse to unfold could happen at any time. There's a place for that in our time. It, can, it, it, it all seems to be coming together. And I, I'm not criticizing that. That's not altogether wrong. We are to be alert and to be looking, but uh, we, because we live in unusual times. The, the world has, has never been so small, so interconnected, and so armed with catastrophic power, and so connected that a virus originating in China can end up in Dallas at some point. We're to live in anticipation. Nevertheless, the Lord warned against setting dates. Failure to, to heed His warning has always resulted in disappointment for believers and embarrassment for the church. So how are we to live? What do we, we, we want the Lord finding us doing when He comes? Leading evangelistic crusades? Hacking our way through jungles to get the gospel to the heathen? Well, I suppose if that's what you're called to do, then that's what you should do. But that's not true of most of us. Paul has already told us in the instruction that he gave in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11, how we're to be living. It may seem benign, and it perhaps is, but this is how we're to live. This is what we're to be doing, making it, making it, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands. In other words, lead a responsible life that is helpful to others. Take care of the responsibilities you have for the day in your business, in the home, in school, wherever God has called you to be and to serve Him. Live an honest, orderly life, a warm and wholesome life. And when the opportunities are there, give the gospel. People should see your life and want to hear about the gospel. Or they may challenge you. And Peter said in 1 Peter 3 verse 15, Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now, that's the quiet life. But first and foremost, the quiet life is, is living in communion with the Lord. It's abiding in the Lord. In John 17, verse 3, the Lord said in His prayer, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. First and foremost, what the Lord desires from us is the essence of eternal life, and that is fellowship. He wants us to abide in Him, to think on Him, to pray to Him, study and learn about Him, and walk with Him. That's the greatest preparation for a well-lived life and for the Lord's return. That, that conditions us for the duties of the day. That prepares us for the responsibilities of, de of the day. And that's what He wants to find us doing when He comes, being responsible living the kind of life he's, he's prescribed. And, and, the, and central to it all is thinking of him, having him on our mind. 
We've all been touched by, by scenes on the news of uh, servicemen and women returning home from Afghanistan or Iraq and uh, coming in an unexpected um, appearance in uniform at a, a son or daughter's uh, school. I don't know if you've seen those. I've seen a number of those scenes. And there's a look of disbelief on the child's face. The, she rushes to her father, embraces him, and the tears flow. It's a, a moment of complete surprise and overwhelming joy for the child. And why is that? Because he or she loves her parent, thinks about him every day, longs to see him, then unexpectedly there he is. Their hope is realized. That's how we are to wait for Christ's return. And the more we learn who He is and who we are and learn what He sacrificed to give us, eternal life, the more we will long for His coming. Don't sleep. Be alert, Christian. Be ready. And if you're here asleep in the sleep of unbelief, wake up. And if you're sleeping through the sermon, wake up. <laughs> this is what I really want you to hear. Time is fleeting. Time is short. The Lord is at the door. He may come at any time. He may come tonight. But if not, if He does not come for a thousand years, you won't be here for a thousand years. You're just a vapor. And we'll be leaving soon. And we'll meet Him. Not as a friend, but as a judge. Today is the day of salvation. And the Lord is standing with arms open wide to receive every rebel who repents and turns to Him. That's Isaiah 65, verse 2. Trust in Him as Savior. As we sung at, the, at our last hymn, run into the arms of God. They're wide open for those who repent and come. And He will receive you. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to live a life of sobriety, live a life of wakefulness and watching. The Lord may come soon. Well, let's end with a hymn. Let's stand and sing hymn number 47 in the Songs of Praise book, Oh, the Love of My Redeemer. Father, we thank You for such a great Redeemer who's purchased our forgiveness and washed our sins away and will come for us someday, maybe in our lifetime. But even if not, we'll come to Him. We'll come to You. We'll be received into the glory of heaven, all because of what He's done. We give You praise and thanks for Your grace and Your sacrifice for us. May we live for You in the time You've given us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.